Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming along. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, some thoughts we've had uh, about renewable energy um, uh, since I retired from uh, working on the bionic ear. Uh, well, I've actually worked on this for a lot of time before that. Um, anyway, I'm going to talk first about solar. And when it comes to solar, um, many people will put up um, information which looks uh, hugely optimistic. And um, so I'm looking at it from the most pessimistic viewpoint. So I'm, I've drawn a little square there in Australia, which uh, is, is, is the area that you'd need to, to use to produce all of the energy that we use. And that when I'm saying all of the energy, I'm talking about primary energy, that is actually the amount of energy that goes into the power stations, not the amount of energy that comes out of power stations, about a factor of three between them. I'm not talking about the energy that goes into the fuel tank of your car, but the energy that comes out of that, uh, the, the engine of the car. So uh, it's, there's a big uh, difference there. And I'm talking about using solar technology which is not based on 1,000 watts per square metre, which is, you know, when you're looking at it straight into the blazing sun, you're getting 1,000 watts per square metre. In actual fact, a solar power station can only collect about maximum about 15 watts per square metre, not 1,000. Uh, and, and I'm not even going to talk about 15 watts, not 11 watts, which is used by uh, Beyond Zero Emissions, a group called Beyond Zero Emissions. Four and a half watts is what we're building or we're planning to build uh, in uh, many places. So four and a half watts per square metre doesn't sound very much. But nevertheless, that's that little white square you see there is the area that you would need to provide all of our energy from solar. Now, of course, the big question is going to be uh, how would you do that? You know, you've got to store it and it's going to be very expensive and all those sorts of things. Now, this is um, from the Zero Carbon Australia plan, which was put together by Beyond Zero Emissions. And um, you'll get a reference to that uh, plan later on. But on what you see on this graph here is their plan where they're providing a certain amount of power from wind, that's the blue, and then a certain amount of power from concentrating uh, solar thermal. So that's, that's the orange. Uh, so that's uh, being provided by solar. Uh, a little bit of hydro, so small that you can hardly see it, but that's the that's the reality. We really don't produce very much solar, uh, hydropower. Uh, and then you see uh, a whole lot of stuff at the top there, which is kind of a yellow colour, and that's the excess. Now, the reason for that excess is that we've got, because renewable energy is by nature quite variable, uh, many sources of renewable energy are uh, very variable, and the load varies, because you see uh, on here, this is the load there. So this is all, this part here is uh, solar, that's wind, and that's excess, wasted. Is this one, is this one working? Yeah, it is, okay. So um, Andrew Dick, who spoke at the last session, talked about a little bit about pumped hydro as a method of storing energy, and, uh, and he dismissed hydro really because he said, well, Australian hydro has already been fully exploited and there's not much more he can do. And I was thinking about this and I thought, well, maybe so, but you don't really need to have pumped hydro storage in, uh, in mountains uh, and fed from rivers because that's the big problem. If you wanted to use the existing hydroelectric systems to store power, you would have to, first of all, fill up the dams. Well, we've been trying to the decades to fill up the dams, they haven't been full for a very long time. If you wanted to fill up those dams, you would have to cut off the environmental flow for uh, decades. It's not going to work. Uh, so, and then you would have to put in a whole lot more infrastructure in these national parks. So that's not going to work either. So I was thinking, well, why not have, do it somewhere else and use seawater? Why would, you don't need to use fresh water. So the whole idea here is... You would do it in somewhere, for example, on the Nullarbor, where you, there's cliffs that are about 90 metres high. And what you basically do is you pump water up to the top of a dam, which you can create there, a, a pond, I've called it, not very deep, 20 metres deep, quite as big as you, as wide as you like. And so when you've got excess, excess power, you pump water up 
seawater up into that dam and when you need power, for example at night or when the wind's not blowing, when everybody's got their air conditioners on, then you run the water down through to back into the sea. So this is a, this is a form of battery. This, so this is a, what I've, uh, I'm showing here is a 200 gigawatt hour battery. That's a terribly big battery. And it would be a, a battery that would run uh, Australia for, well, it would run Australia for about uh, 10 hours if, you, if, if all of Australia just ran on that, nothing else but that. But of course, power is being generated by various other uh, renewable sources and the, the, the demand is highly fluctuating. So you don't actually need a battery as big as this. And these calculations are being done, have been done, uh, and they are actually in my book, which um, Barry mentioned before. Now, uh, you might think this is a bit of pie in the sky idea, but actually it's already been done about uh, 1980, sorry, 1998. Uh, this uh, this uh, demonstration uh, pilot plant was built in um, Okinawa and it's still in operation today. Now, when you think about renewable energy, of course, it, it does, the, the cost does come up as a, as a big issue and I thought, well, it's no good thinking of things which are going to be way, way too expensive. And so I, I had to think about comparing it with prices of other kinds of energy. Not that you could consider, for example, nuclear to be renewable, but at least it could keep, keep us going for quite a long time. Uh, the estimates vary between 100 years and 1,000 years, depending on what sort of reactors you use. And I used uh, a report to just get some comparative costs. I used a report from the US Energy Information Administration, just a very recent report, um, and here are some figures for the years, I don't know why they're doing this, they're putting 2011 and 2010, but I'll, let's, I'll, I'll call it, anyway, 2010, 2009, doesn't matter. Uh, they've got in, the, this is an extract of their table for nuclear renewables, uh, and they've got there um, the two years which are circled um, in, in red. And below there you see the, uh, the capital costs per kilowatt of uh, installations which generate uh, electricity. So you see there, um, between the two years from 2010 to 2011, they actually upped the cost of nuclear by 37%. Uh, these are the figures that they've given there around Three, that's four thousand to five thousand dollars per kilowatt, uh, and they've also listed their solar thermal and solar photovoltaic. And interestingly, there the figures that they've given are quite similar, really, to the nuclear. It's a bit of a surprise because I didn't even expect that. But the, the reason for the difference, uh, the, the, the being so similar, is that nuclear is, would be based on a capacity factor of something like 80 or 90 percent, that is the nuclear power would be available most of the time, whereas the solar thermal uh, and photovoltaic is only available maybe a quarter of the time or a third of the time. But nevertheless, there's been a trend, and if you look at the, the, the relative costs of the nuclear and the solar, you see that nuclear, in their estimation, has gone up quite a lot in the last, just in a year, uh, and the solar has gone down. And this, I'm talking here about the levelised cost, which is actually the cost of generating electricity per megawatt hour. So this is not <coughs> talking about capital cost anymore, it's talking about the cost of electricity. And basically, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a few years, you can imagine that these two uh, trajectories might actually cross. Now there's a lot of hazards in uh, providing power and in, this, uh, in Australia we've got our own special ones but some of these are, are worldwide but with wind power uh, there's a lot of paranoia relating to wind. Uh, people think it's bad for your health. Wind power, they say that the sound is bad for your health. I think the jury is well and truly out on that one. I'm actually got a, because I work for the Bionic Ear Institute and for cochlear, I've got an interest in sound and noise. 
uh, and uh, detrimental effects of those and actually you're going to start a project to check what is the sound level from a wind farm and, uh, and how does that sound level compare, for example, to the sound of, uh, of um, the ocean? Because I don't hear too many people complaining that the ocean, the noise of the ocean has affected their health. If you do hear, as soon as a wind farm is proposed somewhere, a whole lot of people getting up and, um, and demonstrating about that because uh, they say they think it's bad for health. So anyway, jury's out on that. Wave, the calculations show that you'd, use, you'd have to use quite a lot of Australia's coasts to produce enough power from Wave to, uh, to power the country, and I can't see that happening. Uh, there would be a big objection to that. Tidal, again, there's been a lot of environmental, uh, there's a lot of environmental impact, a lot of uh, fury about using tidal power. Hydro, we've already talked about that, it's fully exploited, really. New nuclear, I see it, that as a, as, a, as a democratic roadblock. I am not against nuclear power, but I can see that in Australia, I originally wrote this slide, I put political suicide. You know, any party that tries to put in nuclear power, at least in the current situation, uh, is basically um, guaranteeing losing the next election, or my view, anyway. Another issue about nuclear is, it, it, although an awful lot of nuclear power stations are being built now, in, uh, especially in Asia, very, very few in uh, Europe and none uh, since the 70s in the USA, uh, the proportion of nuclear power has dropped from 17% in 2001 to, to only 13% in 2009, there seems to be again a trend there that nuclear power seems to have some problems which people are not happy about. Now nuclear has another problem, it's vulnerable to cost blowouts and you can, uh, you can imagine in Australia we would just have an almighty bun fight with hostile unions, protests and so on. So what are our options? Our options, if we could get around the political problem, would be to buy lots of nuclear from China or we could build lots of solar in Australia. Uh, to me, it seems that the choice is fairly uh, clear. Uh, why would we buy a lot of nuclear power from China uh, and send all that money overseas when we could actually build stuff here uh, and, um, and provide employment and, and the power? And I don't think that the issues of storage of power or the costs of solar power are going to stop that. Uh, so now, I, I'll use a parallel, you know, could we build so much, could we build so many power stations, uh, solar power stations? And I think we could because I use the, um, the uh, comparison with uh, the Liberty ships which were built in the United States uh, during the war. Uh, and they were basically to replace the Allied uh, merchant fleet which had been, it had been uh, sunk or a large proportion of which had been sunk. So when the, when the Liberty ship uh, project started, they were, the first ships took 230 days to build, but the last ships only took 43 days to build. And uh, towards the end of that uh, process, of that project, they were building three ships a day. So I think that just illustrates how once you could get the ball rolling and you could get an industry going, you could just keep churning out these, uh, these solar power stations uh, the, the, the whole thing would, whole process would be refined. People would uh, jump on the bandwagon, work out cheaper ways of doing it, better ways of doing it, and do faster ways of doing it. So I think it's uh, entirely uh, feasible for Australia to do that. For Australia to do the same thing with nuclear, I don't think it's feasible because we're not talking about large numbers of nuclear power stations, maybe 10 or 20, but uh, that would be... So I see solar as being realistic, I see it as being viable, and I see it as politically expedient. So what we do need, though, is we don't need to, to, to just decide we want to do one particular thing and that's the only thing that gets done. What you really need is to optimise the system. So a lot of technologies are available. And an engineering approach to that is to look at a whole system, say, which technologies are available, how much does it cost? Let's model the whole thing, uh, see how we can get out of this 
the most, uh, in the most efficient way. So I'm not, I'm not excluding any of these other technologies like wind, geothermal, maybe it'll come good, who knows. Uh, we will need high voltage links, well they're no big deal, uh, they've been built a lot before uh, to transmit power over a thousand kilometres or more. We need storage, we talked about that, you can have, uh, apart from the pump storage, there's uh, storage which uh, uses uh, molten salts which is well and truly uh, underway now in Spain. So, and then possibly someday liquid um, fluoride thorium. So I, I, I specifically mentioned thorium because thorium is a, a, fil, a, a fuel which, uses, which produces far less toxic uh, waste and, uh, f uh, and <coughs> that waste has a far shorter uh, half-life than any of the uh, uh, waste products from uranium. And I'm sure uh, Ian will have a few words to say about that. Um, so just to finish, uh, links here, if you want to look up any more of the uh, information of the sort I'll be talking about, my own book is uh, Australian Eng en Sustainable Energy by the Numbers, and that is down downloadable from the Melbourne Energy Institute website, and uh, so is the Beyond Zero em uh, Emissions report, the Zero Carbon Australia 2020. That report is also available. The both both available for free, but you can also buy paper copies from them at a modest price, uh, they'll post them to you. Thank you.